So we conclude this month of Advent with love. Paul tells us that while faith, hope, and love remain, the greatest of these is love. And that's what the baby born in Bethlehem is all about. God in the flesh, but also God's love in the flesh. You know, when Mary was found to be with child uh, before the marriage, uh, Joseph planned to quietly dismiss her and and divorce her and, and not shame her. That wasn't until an angel came and told him differently. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20 says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. See, from the very beginning, this was to be God's gift. This was God's plan. This was God's sacrifice in order to bring his people back to him and reestablish that relationship that we've been longing for. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 that when we look at, at Jesus, it's the demonstration of God's love for each one of us. So in the birth of Christ, we have the event of all events. It's like the, the main character is now stepping onto the stage and, and the plot line of what's been happening up until this point is going gonna, is gonna to shift, is going to change. So if this is the place to be, uh, for all of time and all of eternity to be here and these things that takes place in Bethlehem, have you ever stopped to wonder who exactly was invited to be a part of these things? Who made it onto God's guest list? I was amazing last week watching the film clips and, and watching some of the stuff on the internet about uh, the highlights from Nelson Mandela's memorial service. It was quite a scene for those of you that kind of tuned in or, or, and kept up with it. It was a virtual who's who of the world leaders and, and people that made their way to journey to South Africa to pay their respects to the former uh, South African president. 91 heads of state and 10 former heads of state, 75 dignitaries and 86 delegations from around the world all made their way to South Africa. Among those gathered are U.S. President Barack Obama and former Presidents Bush and Clinton. It was just incredible. Prince Charles and David Cameron representing England. Merkel from Germany. Halone from France. Global icons like Oprah Winfrey, Peter Gabriel, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, U2's lead singer Bono, and actress Charlene Theron. Even two of the Spice Girls are rumored to have attended. You know you've made it if a couple of Spice Girls show up at your funeral. Can you imagine? While all of these and, and many others were granted access to the memorial stadium, memorial that took place in this large stadium, only 4,500 were the invited guests that were invited to return to Mandela's home for the private funeral. All those that I've mentioned made the list, but there were a few people like Nelson Mandela's extended family, his nieces, nephews, and cousins, and even some of his lifelong friends he grew up with in the same village that were left off the list and were not allowed to attend. What about the guest list for Christ? I mean, if you you think about this, you have Mandela that that spent his entire life fighting for the little guy and someone who who has has tried to, to take down the apartheid leaders and has has fought and, and done ver- various different things to, uh, to attack r- racism and poverty and inequality. Yet in his death, he's surrounded by the elites of the world. But if you kind of compare that to the birth of, of Christ, who was it that made his guest list? Well, we've been introduced in, in some of our, our drama to the story of Anna and Mary and Zechariah. And by the way, haven't we been blessed by the great job that Leah Egley and Allison Brown and Cindy Thomason did? Let's give them a hand. Just fantastic this week. And and certainly thanks to the great folks who put together this set um, with Janet Campbell and Amy Smith and Lynette Bass and, and of course, our chorus this morning. Let's give them a hand as well. It's just been wonderful. So many talented folks. So I want us to focus on two folks two different groups that made the list. That was the shepherds that we briefly talked about last week and also the magi. 
If you remember, Luke tells us that the shepherds are out there on the field and they're, they're there in the evening and they're tending to the flocks when all of a sudden the, the host of heaven descend upon them. So heaven comes down and glory just fills their souls. And so these shepherds that are out there with their sheep are given a, a front row seat to this song of grandeur and also the coming favor of the Lord is announced. So all this is happening. These guys are just taking all this in. And after the host of heaven and the angels return up to where they had come from, the shepherds are sitting there and they're just amazed. They decide, we've got to go into Bethlehem to see what has taken place. And so as they make their way in, they see the baby wrapped in, in cloths, lying in a manger. Well, why were the shepherds invited to this party? Why did they make the guest list? It's just incredible to, to think about these different things. It's, it's that they would be the witnesses. It's kind of like when a tornado comes through town uh, and it, it causes all kinds of destruction. I'm convinced by who the reporter puts on the screen in interviews that no sane uh, person that's plain spoken or, or a rational person ever witnesses a storm based on who they chose to, to report about it. So why would they choose shepherds? If you've got to get the message out, why would you choose the choose these guys well some think that um, it, it's just a nod to the great shepherds of old if you think of Abraham Isaac and Jacob they were all shepherds and certainly Moses and you know the, the prince from Egypt that, that leaves he spends 40 years out there before he receives his calling to go back into Egypt and deliver the people and then you have King David and the man after God's own heart well he was a shepherd and probably tended uh, his, his flock right there in the same fields there and around Bethlehem. So all these things are, are happening there. Other scholars say, no, their inclusions uh, kind of are looking forward to the ministry of Jesus, who's going to describe himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. But still, other scholars say, you know, it, it's not about the shepherds at all, but kind of what Lincoln was talking, it's more about the sheep. And it's very likely the animals that... Uh, that they're tending that night will be used for the sacrifices just five miles up the road into Jerusalem. And so we really don't know exactly why that they were uh, chosen, but certainly all these are, vi are viable options. But could it be that God has always chosen to minister to and chosen to minister through the least of these, those not esteemed by the world? If you remember when God called poor Gideon to rescue his people from the hand of, of Midian, he, he's out there, he's down on the threshing floor, and he, he's fearful of the Midians coming in and, and seeing him so, and, and taking away his grain, and so he's kind of crouched down there doing this, and God sends a, a messenger and calls him and says, Mighty warrior Gideon, you're going to go and, and deliver my people. And Gideon's kind of looking around, is there another Gideon? Because uh, I'm the least in my family. Uh, we're, our family is the lowest in our clan. Our clan's only in a half tribe of Manasseh. But God says, Gideon, I'm going to use you. You and I are going to partner together to strike them down. See, the Lord usually calls the lowly rather than the mighty on his behalf. Still shepherds. Why shepherds? I think sometimes that we're guilty of, of thinking of, of King David, you know, and he's out there. We, we picture the grassy lawn and he's got his harp, and he's got a little baby lamb in his lap. And, and so we tend to romanticize this position of the shepherds. But in reality, if we, if we look at what's going on, that's definitely not what, what's happening here. And in, in the first century, uh, the shepherding had lost all of its luster. And the shepherds kind of made up the lowest class of people. And in the Talmud, which is kind of this, this collection of interpretations from the rabbis that says, no help is to be given to the heathen or shepherds. So that, that shares is kind of where they are. They're, they're just, uh, just a little bit ahead of, of lepers on the whole social pyramid thing. So why would you choose these guys? Well, because of the nature of their work, they were unable to attend any religious services. And even if they, they wanted to go to church, they were viewed as ceremoniously unclean. And they were kind of nomads. They, they had to kind of take their sheep to go find greener pastures and fresh water. So they didn't really have roots. Why in the world would God choose these guys 
to be the witnesses. God chooses to work wonders through these forgotten, despised, and lowly servants. Mary captures this idea in Luke chapter 1 and verse 52 in Mary's song. He has brought down the rulers from the thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. Paul continues this idea in, in his letter to the church at Corinth when he says, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. He chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, so that no one may boast before him. That's why he chose the shepherds. That's what this is about. Well, as low as the shepherds were on the social ladder, at least they were Jews. This couldn't be said of the Magi. Who exactly were these Magi? And what, what, what can we learn from them? Because if we look at who God chooses to put on this guest list, it's going to tell us a lot about his heart and what he intends for the message. Well, the Magi are, are first recorded back in 6th century B.C. Most believe that they're wise men serving in the courts of, of Persia. Zoroastrians, by faith, they saw a special insight in the world's comings and goings and affairs by looking to the planets and the stars. That's who they were. Well, in, in addition to astrology, many believe that they kind of dabbled in the magic arts and also divination as well in, in pursuit of this esoteric knowledge, this special understanding. that they, they were called to be the wise men. You know, if, if you think about it, when Judah and Israel's kings were at crucial points, and, and they've got to know what God's will is, well, they would go and, and bring in the prophets. And, and the prophets would speak a word on God's behalf to give them clear understanding of what they're supposed to do. Well, the pagan kings didn't have anyone. They couldn't call in the prophets. And so they would call in their wise men to offer them assistance. So these guys were to produce some, some insight. So they're, they're seeking all different ways to bring about this knowledge to present for the king. Well, Matthew's readers certainly would have thought of the encounter of young Daniel. Remember how he, he was taken away and led off to Babylon? And he's serving there in the courts when the king gets this vision, this crazy dream, and he calls in Daniel and the others. And Nebuchadnezzar says, you've got to tell me what this all means. Daniel 2 and verse 2 says, the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the astrologers, to tell him what he had dreamed. You've got to be kidding. This is the group that has now made their way to Jerusalem to witness the birth of Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Why were they included? You know, even though the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18 forbids divination, which includes astrology, for one special event in history, the God who rules the heaven chose to reveal himself where the pagans were looking. God is at work where non-religious folks will be, will be searching. And God's working to open their hearts. You know, Matthew is not trying to condone astrology here, but rather he's challenging the religious folks. His Jewish brothers and sisters saying, look what God is doing. This thing that we've been waiting on for hundreds of years is now happening, and look at who God invited to the party. He wants them to get rid of their prejudice against outsiders of the faith. Even the most pagan of pagans can respond to Jesus if given the opportunity. That's good news. You know, when, when the wise men arrive in, into town, I'm, I'm guessing all of their entourage that's with them is probably just not three guys that that kind of legend grew later on but so you've got this big entourage and and certainly messengers of Herod say uh, there's this group that's come in he's like well bring them into my court so the guys make their way in and start telling of why they're there and and Herod's like well I've got to call in my religious uh, group that that's up on on the scrolls and what's happening and different prophecies and so he brings them in and they start sharing about the the verses that, that prophesied that this coming Messiah. But what's interesting is, you've got this outside group that says, we're seeing some stuff in the stars. It's pointing to something happening, and we think the birth of the king is going on right now. It, it's taking place. You would think those that are up on scriptures, those that have been waiting and hungering for this day, 
would have walked five miles up the road to Bethlehem. Yet it's only the Magi that continue their journey. They find the mother and the child, and they start bowing down and worshiping him. You know, the story ends with the Magi receiving kind of supernatural revelation from God, warning them, don't go back the way that you came. So we have these ultimate outsiders that now become the insiders for God's most precious story. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. If you're new to Scripture, just kind of open the Bible to the middle. You'll, you'll find Psalms. Go over a couple of books to the right, and there's Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60. Because what we're going to see is this was no fluke, but God's plan all along. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1 says this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar, and your daughter shall be carried on the hip. And the wealth of the nation shall come to you. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of God. Just incredible. This was God's plan all along. We know the gift from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's what the love is all about. Now we have to decide here as individuals and as a church, what are we going to do with that gift? We know what this love is about. What do we do? First thing is God calls us to share the gift. You know, inviting the shepherds to be the first witnesses uh, proves kind of the old adage that uh, God doesn't call the qualified, that God qualifies the call. You know, it has very little to do with the actual messenger. It has everything to do with the message. You know, a lot of times I'll, I'll talk with, with people and they're like, well, I've got this co-worker, I, I've got this friend, uh, can I bring him by? And I said, well, well, sure, but first share your story. Share what's going on. Well, I don't know. I just don't feel quite. What if they ask me questions? I said, it's about the message, not about the messenger. Luke 2 and verse 16, we read it earlier. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had told them. So what did the shepherds do? Hopefully you'll remember these three things. Number one, they heard the word of God. The shepherds were, were out there and they were told, this thing is happening. So they've got this message from God. Number two, they went to encounter the Christ. So we hear and then we go and encounter and see for ourselves and, and prove the validity. And then number three, they shared their story. Okay, what is their story? Because we understand their story, we'll understand what our story is. Their story is a combination of number one and number two. See, each of us has been presented with the same story, the same gospel message that my parents received, that my grandfather preached about, and his parents, and, and on, same story gets passed down from generation to generation. That's why it's so exciting seeing uh, the, the Jones family. You, you boys did an awesome job singing and everything. Being a part and having this story passed down for generation. So we encounter this story. That, that's the first thing that we have to do. But the second thing is we have to accept this message. The love of God. And once we understand that, the love of God and the power of the Spirit begins a work within us. So we're encountering this story, and things begin to change within our hearts. Paul describes it in Ephesians 2, and verse 4 and 5. When we receive the love of God, it opens our hearts, and we become alive to Christ. So we receive the word, it starts a work within us. And that's when it becomes your story. And that's when things get exciting. Because we, like the shepherds, are invited to be part of the meta-narrative, the ongoing story that started back in Genesis and continues on with, with the birth of Christ we're, we're celebrating now and the death and everything else, getting ready for his second coming. We're added to that story. And so that becomes what we share with others. And so when our knowledge is combined with experience, 
then we share that and leave the rest to God, knowing that God prepares others to receive it. That's the second part. God prepares others to receive it. You know, I'm always amazed that uh, well-meaning brothers and sisters uh, in, in, in Christ have a complete acceptance wholesale into the story of God. They believe in the virgin birth. They believe that, that uh, throughout his ministry that he walked on water, that he healed the sick, even raised the dead. We, they believe wholeheartedly in, in the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, three days later that he was raised. They, they believe in the ascension. They believe all this and said, this is God's plan. I, I believe it. I, I buy in. I mark off on that. That's the gospel. But we don't have enough faith that God is working on the hearts of others to receive this soul-saving message. You know, it's so easy for us to kind of prejudice to who would be receptive and who'd be a good candidate. And so we encounter someone, and, and the Spirit puts in us a prompting we need to share this with them. They need Jesus in their life. But then we also have this other voice that kind of gives a, well, I don't know. It, it, it may be awkward. I don't think they'd receive it anyway. So we take a step back. I kind of learned this lesson the hard way. When I was a junior in college, we took a spring break campaign up to New York City. And I was excited. We're going to get to go to New York City for the first time. Well, in addition to working in a soup kitchen and doing some other projects, the main uh, purpose for this group of college kids to come up was to help this new church that was being started on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And so they, they asked us to come be a part of this. And the idea was to get the word out about their church to those in the community. And so they asked us to help them prepare and pass out invitations to a two-night event on a Friday and Saturday night of that week where they're bringing in Landon Saunders. And they said, we're not going to ask them to come to our church building. So they rented out a, a hotel suite and, and set up some chairs. And Landon was going to come in and kind of present a gospel message in a way that, that's open to others. And so they ask us to go out every morning and every afternoon onto the streets there in Manhattan and to stand at the entrances and the exits to the subway with these invitations. And so that's what we did every morning. We'd pass them out as people were hurrying on to work and as they're coming home and getting ready to, uh, to start it all over again. And so that's what we did day after day. Well, on Friday, we started running a little low on our invitations. And so I kind of made, okay, I've got like 30 or 40 left today. That's all I've got. So I've got to predetermine who would be the most receptive because I've got to be selective in who I pass it out to. And so, you know, I started looking through this, and I'm like, okay, a mom with a teenage daughter, here you go. Um, and then there was a businessman that, that was off, you know, kind of gruff and in a hurry. I'm going to pass on him. Well, there's a sweet elderly gentleman. Hey, we'd love to have you. Well, there were some punk rocker guys. No, I don't think we're going to give you one of those. And Well, there was a young couple. I was hoping maybe they had some kids. I passed it out to them. What was interesting is, is these three punk rock guys that had tattoos and piercings and the whole bit, one of them stopped, and he's walking down the steps, and he notices that the person in front of me has gotten one of these invitations, and he looks behind, and a woman but it also has an invitation, and he's like, hey, I can get one. So he walks back against the flow, walks up the stairs, and asks for an invitation. So I'm like, oh, God, I've only got 14 left, but here you go, okay? Well, later on that night, um, we, we had passed out close to 5,000 of these invitations throughout the week. And there were about 50 that showed up that evening on, on top of those from the church. And the preacher there was ecstatic that we even got 50 to come to it. Out of those I personally passed out an invitation to, only one guy showed up. Can you guess who it was? You know, I don't know if he was converted. We left on early Saturday morning. But I was converted that night. That is God, not me, that offers an invitation. You know, we have no idea what that natural ast astronomical phenomenon was that night. Where there was Jupiter and Saturn is coming in line to where the guys... Because that happened about that time. Also, Halley's Comet came through a couple years before that. Some say it might have been that. We simply don't know. But here's the point. In this spectacle, whatever it was, these Magi astrologers perceive it to be a sign that something big is happening, the fulfillment of the coming of the Jewish king. 
and they set off on this journey towards Jerusalem, these were not guys that go to church. These were not people that even practiced the Jewish faith. But yet God had opened their heart to the point where they were ready to take action because they were seeking after him and they were watching for his coming. We think about the guest list. Caesar from Rome didn't make it. Neither did Herod, who sat on the throne in Jerusalem. I don't even think the mayor of Bethlehem got the invitation. But we start looking at this, and we consider the ministry of Jesus and what it was all about. Who did receive the invitation to witness this event of all events? It's not surprising. You know, Jesus would, would make a career of rejecting the marks of status or privilege. He loved on lepers. He played with children. He washed the feet of his disciples. He encouraged women to join his entourage. And finally, he submitted to crucifixion at the hands of foreign power. So that's what God's love is truly all about. The love is for all, and the love is to be carried by all. That's what the dawn of, of love's pure light is all about. This white candle that was lit, that was lit earlier represents Christ. Jesus not only warms our hearts, but he's also be taken to the world and shared with others. So as we pass this flame of Christ from candle to candle, my prayer is to symbolically represent the receiving of Christ's message, but also the reviving of our call as Christ's messengers to pass this love to those around us. My prayer for us will truly will be the light of the world.